Here's a screencast on basic chemistry. We've already talked a little bit about basic chemistry and how chemistry is the study of matter. Let's keep going. Let's, let's go a little bit deeper than that. Um, matter refers to anything that has mass and occupies space. You're all familiar with the periodic table of elements. Um, there's more than 92 elements on the table, but um, only 92 of them are naturally occurring. There are several more. There are more added every year that are synthetic, uh, which means that are man-made. But there's 92 that, that primarily um, will form naturally. Of those 92, there's only six that primarily make up what we are. They make up 90% of us. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. How can you remember that? Schnapps. Okay, C-H-N-O-P-S. Makes up 98% of what we are. And what are we? Well, fundamentally, we're atoms. Okay, you can break us down into atoms. You can go smaller, obviously. We're going to talk about subatomic particles, which means particles within the atom. There's quarks, there's neutrinos, there's uh, the Higgs, Higgs boson, we talked about that. Um, but we're, we're going to stick with atoms. We'll go within atoms and talk um, about three essential subatomic particles. But um, atoms are the, are the fundamental units of matter. Um, and, the, and the three subatomic particles we're going to stick with, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, I'm going to back up just a second. We're going to talk about these three subatomic particles in terms of three things. We're going to talk about their charge, we're going to talk about their size, and their location. Charge, mass, and location. Mass is probably a better way to put it than size. Um, protons have a positive charge. They have a mass of 1 AMU. They're so small that they have their own unit, atomic mass units, and they kind of define the unit. Protons have a mass of 1 AMU, and they're located in the nucleus. Neutrons? They're neutral. They have also have a mass of 1 AMU, and they're in the nucleus alongside protons. How about electrons? They're negatively charged. Their mass is negligible. Okay, It's not necessarily zero. right? It's, it doesn't seem possible to have no mass and exist. But it's so small that they consider it zero AMU. They orbit the nucleus in electron orbitals. You'll hear them called orbital shells. Um, clouds, things like that, as far as the time of structure goes. You'll see when we look at the periodic table, it tells you a lot about an element. Each one's unique. They have an atomic symbol, usually a capital letter. Um, if it's two letters, the second letter is going to be lowercase. Um, this is our atomic mass, or the mass number, and then the atomic number. Here we go. Mass number tells you the mass of one atom of that particular element. So, one atom of carbon has a mass of 12 AMU. That's the superscript above. The subscript um, is your atomic number. Atomic number tells you the number of protons. So, one atom of carbon, not only does it have a mass of 12 AMU, but it contains six protons. There it is. This is a condensed version of the periodic table, but they're uh, grouped based on their characteristics. Vertically, they're in groups, families, um, and they chemically behave similar to one another. Horizontally, we're talking about periods. Okay, Those periods towards the top um, are going to be smaller atomically, and as you move down, this period is going to be larger than this one. This one's larger than this one, and so on, and so on, and so on. So size increases as we go down. We'll talk more about periodic trends as we get farther into the um, into the unit. But here's our group numbers. Like I said, they behave chemically similar to one another. We'll talk about why that is later on. And the period is going horizontally. Here is the periodic table. Now, if you're watching this and you haven't already, you should hit pause and you should color code your periodic tables. What I want to stress is these families, these groups. Okay, Group 1, we're talking about the alkali metals. That's um, excluding hydrogen. We'll talk about why hydrogen is there. But these are the alkali metals. They all behave the same because of the number of valence electrons. These are the alkaline earth metals. 
here in group 2. You should note that on your periodic table. These in the middle are the transition metals. Over here, we have the poor metals along the stair step, the metalloids, nonmetals here, including hydrogen, the halogens in group 7, and finally in group 8, the noble gases, the inert gases. So hit pause, color code your groups. Uh, not necessarily worried down about these groups down here, these periods down here. Um, mostly synthetic. We're not going to get into those as much. But you can see how they are, they are orientated um, according to their characteristics, according to their chemical activity, whether they are inert, whether they're reactive, etc. Why are they inert? Why are they reactive? Well, um, let's talk about electrons. Electrons have everything to do with reactivity. Are they going to react? Are they going to be inert? Well, typically they're neutral. And atoms on the periodic table, as they show here, are neutral. What does that mean they're neutral? Well, we already said that protons have a positive charge. Electrons have a negative charge. Atoms normally have as many electrons as protons. So if the electrons are negative and the protons are positive, if they have the same number, mathematically that makes sense that the charges are going to balance each other out and come out to zero. Neutral. Why do the electrons stick around? Well, they're orbiting, right? What, stick, what keeps them in their orbital? We know that opposite charges attract. Electrons are negative, protons are positive, so that opposite charge, that force is going to keep them there. It's going to keep them revolving in their orbitals or their shells and keep them from going away. Quick review. How do we find protons? We look at the periodic table. What's the atomic number? That's going to tell us protons. How do we find neutrons? They're in the nucleus. Um, they also contribute to the atomic mass, unlike electrons. If you wanted to find the number of neutrons, you've got to take the atomic mass minus the atomic number. That'll give you neutrons. Electrons, they're neutral if they're on the periodic table. It says here all elements as they are shown on the periodic table are neutral. So the number of electrons will be the same as the number of protons. I just wanted to hit pause, go through this, and we'll keep going. Isotopes. The reason I, show, I told you how we find neutrons is because there are forms of different elements, carbon is one example, that differ in their number of neutrons. Here's our regular form, our general form of carbon, carbon-12. Six protons, 12 minus six, six neutrons. This is as it exists normally. There's also carbon-13 and there's carbon-14. Carbon-13, how does it differ? Well, its atomic mass is 13 instead of 12. How is that possible? Well, it didn't gain a proton because if it gained a proton, it wouldn't be carbon. It would be nitrogen. So, it can gain and lose electrons, but that doesn't affect the mass. So it had to have gained a neutron. It has an extra neutron. Instead of having six neutrons, it has seven. How about carbon-14? Six protons still. But 14 minus six, that means eight neutrons. So these are still forms of carbon. By definition, they have to be carbon because they have six protons. But they're isotopes because they differ in their number of neutrons. This has seven. This has eight. Okay, and this is basically what this says. Isotopes are radioactive um, because they can give off energy. Some of that energy can be damaging. Finally, um, one last thing about electrons, the octet rule. You've drawn Bohr models in the past. This is what Bohr models look like. Okay, this shows electron distribution. Okay, here's carbon. It has six protons, six electrons, because it's neutral. How many electrons can go in that innermost orbital? Two can. All right, where do the rest go? They go in the next outermost shell. So four go here. How about nitrogen? It has seven.
protons, so it must have seven electrons. Two in the first, five in the next. Oxygen has eight protons. Two in the first, where do the other six go? The next outermost shell. So, you see a trend here. This innermost shell can hold a maximum of two electrons. And those shells outside of it can hold a maximum of eight. Two, eight, eight. If you fill the second shell, you add another one. And that's the octet rule. Octet obviously meaning eight. Bohr models show electron shells as concentric circles around the nucleus. The innermost can hold two, and those outside can hold eight. If that valent shell or this outermost shell is full, that means that that atom is stable. It's happy. It doesn't want to bond with anything else. It doesn't want to gain electrons or lose electrons. It's stable. Two, eight. This outermost shell has one, two, three, four, five. So what's it going to need to do to be happy? It's going to want to gain three because it wants to fulfill that octet rule. So these are how you draw Bohr models. You're showing the number of electrons in each shell. There's a shortcut to this, which I'll get to in another screencast. Um, but the, um, the octet rule, the Bohr model, in a nutshell, is this.